Hello, everybody. Good morning. Let's spice up the morning by talking about testing. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about using component harnesses to test Angular applications and how that's going to help you win. So if you've worked with Angular um, applications before, this might be a familiar tale for you. Let's say that you're working on a K-Drama fan site. And on this fan site, you can navigate to an individual K-drama where you can add comments. Now, this commenting system is pretty standard as far as it goes. You have an input, and you have the uh, submit add button. Sorry, it looks a little washed out. And when you add comments, uh, that submit button enables. Now, if you think about testing this component, and you have experience with Angular, you know that this could be kind of daunting, right? We have to worry about the test bed, we have to worry about uh, detecting changes and interacting with the template and doing uh, working with the debug element, native element, all of those sort of things. So there's a lot going on. And I don't know about you, but this is me. Whenever I have to write UI tests, it gets kind of frustrating. If I describe it in one word, it's fussy, right? It's fussy. So let's make that a better process. I'm Melissa Duncan. I'm a senior developer advocate at Okta in Angular GDE. And I am a fan of K-dramas, thanks to the pandemic. You can find me on the socials at Elisa Duncan. And despite my belly aching about how difficult those tests are, I actually think they're pretty awesome. They're the cat's meow, right? Because I'm totally bought into the value of tests, but we can make this a little bit better of a process. So what I'm going to cover in this talk is how to approach writing automated UI tests, what are component test harnesses, so spoiler on that first bullet point, how test harnesses work behind the scenes, and how to use component test harnesses for maximum win. And a presumption I'm making is that you do have some knowledge about writing component tests in Angular. And if you don't, uh, I'm hoping to have some time at the end for some Q&A so we can get all of that you know, figured out and maybe even share knowledge with each other on some of the pain points that we might have or some tips and tricks that we want to, uh, the, to share. So first, what is a component test? Because there's a lot of different language around testing, and it's none of it standardized. When I talk about a component test, I'm talking about tests that test the UI interactivity within an Angular application and within a unit testing library. And there's also this idea of a deep test versus a shallow test. Deep test meaning that you are testing nested components within, your, um, within the scope of your component test. I will be talking about deep tests today because these will be involving like UI control libraries, which we'll be interacting with. So a test harness, what even is that? As I've mentioned that a couple of times, a test harness encapsulates the imp implementation details of a component into an API for the sole purposes of testing, which is a pretty cool idea. So we're taking the, some of the best practices of, uh, of OOP and not only we're bringing it to the front end into a, you know, what comes down to a JavaScript app, but we're also doing it for the sole purposes of testing, which is even more cool. And how test harnesses help is that you don't have to worry about the inner, working, uh, inner workings of a dependent component, which is the value prop of encapsulation. And you get tests that are easier to read and write and with less maintenance, which is exactly where we want to be. Now we're talking. And this idea is, comes down to the page object. This is what these test harnesses are based off of. This page object is a, uh, something that wraps an HTML fragment or a view, or a component, right? Uh, with application-specific API um, for, for a feature-specific API. And then we can work with those feature APIs instead of worrying about that HTML API, which is kind of a pain to work with. So if we look at an example of what that looks like, let's say we have a login component. And on this login component, we have a input for username, input for password, and what looks like a sign-in button and a forgot your password um, link, maybe. But it doesn't matter. We don't need to worry about what those HTML elements are. 
because we should be able to use an API to interact with them, such as set username, get username, sign in, or forgot password. And if you use Angular Material Components, you have a head start on this because uh, all Angular Material Components have test harnesses for each one of the components starting in Angular B12. And if you aren't on V12 yet, sometimes that happens, then this effort started in V9. So you might have access to some component harnesses. So what we're going to do next is write a test with and without harnesses so we can compare what this looks like side by side and uh, like see this in action, right? So in the sample application, we go back to that uh, Kdrama fan site. But this time, we'll log in and go to the profiles page. Now, this profiles page has a newsletter sign up, which has three material component um, items on there. One is an input, one is that slide toggle, which is like a fancy on off switch to subscribe, and then one is the submit button that looks like a plus sign and has no text. So, if we look at the component template that we'll be testing, because we're going to be looking at the UI interactivity, it looks something like this. Oh, and if you haven't worked with Angular material components before, everything has a mat prefix. Otherwise, it has a, uh, it should be pretty descriptive as to what sort of element it is. I hope you can see that okay. Um, the first, we have the uh, input element, which is a mat input. Next, we have the mat slide toggle component. And this mat slide toggle is that fancy on off switch, and we disable it whenever the email is not set. Next, we have the button, which is the submit button, and that's a mat icon button. OK, so now let's take a look at a test without harnesses to see what this, what are we kind of starting with. So for the test case that the uh, subscribe, subscribe button should be disabled whenever the email is empty, an example like process that we walk through might look like this. So first, we want to get the button element. And we're going to do that by querying the template for the selector button. And then we're going to take that debug element that's returned, but work with the native element, which is the native HTML API, to look at that disabled property and verify that it starts off disabled. Next, let's set an email. To do that, we'll query again, and this time look for that input selector. And then to set the email, we have to work with the native element and set the value as email and dispatch an input event. That's what registers this change, right, and within the HTML API. But then we have to make sure that we're synced up on the Angular side, so we run detect changes. And then finally, we can go back to the original button to verify that the disabled property is no longer, um, no longer set. So this test isn't like the worst because we just have those two elements that we're working with. However, we had to deal a lot with the native HTML API. We had to worry about that implementation detail, right? And it's not really clear at a glance like what's going on with this test because we're worried so much about how to write the test and not exactly focusing on what the test should be testing. So on the other hand, a test with harnesses and this is using the Angular Material Component Harnesses, could look like this. Notice it's a lot shorter. We'll follow the same order of operations so that we can compare side by side. So first, we're going to get the button harness. So we're getting that button, but we're going to call, uh, we're going to call to get the button harness. So I'll talk through that loader get harness bit in a little bit. Then the button harness has API around it that we could use. So one of the methods is, is disabled. Next, to set the email, we can get the mat input harness and then just set the value as such. And then we can go back to the original button and verify that it is no longer disabled. So not only is this test a lot shorter, it was a lot easier to write, and it's also a lot easier to read. We're able to tell at a glance what's going on with this test, and we're able to focus on the functionality that we want to verify. And identifying selectors can be painful without using harnesses. We didn't have this example necessarily in our previous uh, test. However, let's think about that slide toggle. If we want to work with that and interact with it, we might first try querying by the mat slide toggle component selector. Unfortunately, this isn't the interactive portion of the mat slide toggle. What it really is under the covers is a stylized checkbox. So if we wanted to interact with it, we'd have to get the checkbox element, which isn't really, really clear until you dig into the source code or um, inspect it in DevTools, right? Which we shouldn't have to do for a test. That makes the test really brittle. 
what happens if something changes behind the scenes? And plus, we're relying on a non-public API. On the other hand, if you use a harness, identifying selectors is much more straightforward because you just ask for the harness that you want to work with. So when we use the component harnesses for testing this uh, um, Angular app with material components, we saw that we didn't have to query the DOM by selectors. We didn't have to use the native element. We didn't have to dispatch the HTML on the events. And we didn't have to manually run change detection, which means that the tests were easier to read and write. And we got more stable and more resilient tests and allowed us to focus on the behaviors that matter, which is now we're talking about really great testing setup, right? So let's focus on how we can use that more. And all of the Angular Material component test harnesses are built off of the CDK testing API. The CDK testing library is the part that supports interactions, testing interactions with components. So we skipped test setting up the test bed earlier. So let's look at that first, and so we can get look at that harness loader. So we're going to define that harness loader, which is what we use to get a hold of the harness uh, test harness elements. And then after we create the component fixture, this is part of the standard, um, like, what's stubbed out, what's scaffolded out by Angular CLI. Um, after you create that, uh, uh, that component fixture, then we'll pass that component fixture into the method testbedHarnessEnvironment.loader. And that's how we get the harness loader that we can work with to get the uh, test harnesses. But let's take, a diver, uh, let's take a deeper dive into the harness environment and understand this. The harness environment is unique for each testing environment. So that means that it will be different for if you're testing unit tests versus EDE tests or even the testing library that you're running in, right? So if you're, I'm doing this in Karma and that's different than if you wanted to try running this in Jest or something else. You will have to find the harness environment for your testing library. And many times, it might be possible that it's available from the testing library, but if not, then you'll probably find it as a community project. I think that's the case for Jest. But I will be using Karma, which, is the, uh, which uses the testbed harness environment. It is the out-of-the-box default uh, harness environment that is provided by the Angular team. So the testbed harness environment extends from harness environment, and it has two different methods to create harness loaders. We use the first one, which is loader, and it creates a harness loader that is rooted at the fixtures root element, so we can look within the component. It also has another option to create a document root loader, and this creates a harness loader rooted at the documents root, and is particularly useful if you have like an overlay or something that you need to access outside of the component that you're testing. You can also have more than one harness loader if your test requires that sort of setup. So once you have that harness loader, you want to get the component harnesses that you want to, to interact with. So now we're looking at an individual test, and specifically the parts where we're getting that input harness or getting a harness. The harness loader interface has different ways that we can get a hold of harnesses. And there's this first set where we can get a harness and it'll, we pass in the type of harness we're looking for. And what this does is return the very first harness of that type that it comes across in the template or it's gonna reject the promise. Oops. You can also get harness or null, which will return null instead of rejecting the promise. And then get all harnesses, which will return a list of all the harnesses that you're requesting. And then you can also focus your search within a subsection of your component by, calling, by creating a child loader. And what this does is you pass in a selector. So let's say you want to get all the buttons within a nav section of your component. So you can pass in the selector nav, and then you can work with the previous get harness methods to get the type of harnesses you're looking for, like those buttons. So if we look at this in practice, all those, different, uh, all those different ways we can get harnesses, we can get an individual harness by calling loader.getHarness and then passing in the type of harness we're looking for. We can call loader.getAllHarnesses to get that list of all the harnesses of that particular type. And we can also create a child loader and pass in the selector and then get all the harnesses that we're looking for. You can also filter for a harness if you want to really focus your search 
So this makes it easier to look for just the submit button, for example, with the text submit. So what you would do is look for the, uh, added, add the uh, type of harness you're looking for, and then you use a static method with, which is what a convention is, and then you pass in these options. And those options will depend on the harness that you're working with, because you wouldn't expect to be able to filter for the same sorts of uh, um, information from a button versus an input, right? So they will be, they will be based off of the uh, harness that you are wanting to use. So if we look at an example, the MAT input harness filters has the ability to filter by both value and placeholder and either string or regex. So this is one example, and it'll be different for the buttons and for something else as well. If we look at this in practice, then what we'd want to do is uh, add in the value that we want to search for, so a comment such as only cool comments, please. And then we can call loader.get all harnesses and then pass in that option. So now we're going to get all of the MAT input harnesses with the value only cool comments, please. Now, once you have a harness, it is up to the API of that harness you're working with on any further interactions you can take, right? Because now we have, we're looking at the API of um, each page object. So an example is, uh, if you look at the mat input harness, we'll have ways to get, like, is disabled, is required, set name, get value, things that you'd expect to work with for an input control. And it also extends from the base class component harness. That base class component harness has a method, public method that we could all use, and it's called host. What this does is returns the root element of the harness that it's based off of, so kind of like this, but of a UI component. And what this does is return a test element, which is something like the native element that we worked with early, earlier, except it's better because we have another encapsulation layer around, around the native element, and we have a standard API we can work with. So the test element has methods like blur, clear, hover, get class name, things like that, but in a standardized format. And notice that as we work through all these examples, everything is async. That's because it allows to have the latest state on the control. And it handles the change detection for us which is pretty darn sweet. And because we're working with so many async await calls, the CDK library has this handy helper method, parallel, that we could use that acts like a promise resolve, and it also handles a change detection. So in one shot, we can, get, we can make multiple asynchronous calls, such as the, uh, uh, getting the name and the value of a harness. So now that you have all the information that you might need to start working with material component harnesses and to write winning tests, we can win more because we can write our own component test harness. This is where the CDK testing library API really shines. Do you want to write your own component test harnesses if you have any shared components within your application? So this way you have a, uh, all the consumers of that shared component be able to write tests for themselves much easier. And also you want to write your component test harnesses, a custom one, if you have any custom UI components. Even if you use a UI library, sometimes we have to augment that, right, by creating a custom UI component. And in those cases, you'll want to create a test harness around it. And if you're a library author creating a, um, UI components, please create test harnesses. It'll make it easier for the consumers of your library. And with this, we have maximum winning. So to walk through how to create a custom component harness, we'll go back to that K-Drama fan site, and we'll navigate to the individual K-Drama for that commenting section. Now, these, this comment component is using just straight native HTML elements, so we don't have any of the complexities from the Angular Material component library in there. So we'll write a test harness around this. If we look at that component code, here are the, like, the important parts of it. We have the selector, app add comment, and this is important for us to create our test harness. Then in the template, the UI interaction parts, we have just an input element, which is the, for the comments. And then we have a button um, that we'll use for the uh, submit button. Then we have the rest of the implementation of the component, but we're not going to be really using that for this demonstration. 
So the first thing we want to do is define the filters to support querying. And so we're going to create an interface, add comet harness filters, which is following the naming convention that Angular Material already uses, and extend from the base harness filters. Now we want to think about how we want to query. Now for a commenting component, it probably makes sense to filter by comment, and that's by string. So now we can work on creating that component test harness. To do so, we'll create the class, add comment harness, which is also following the naming convention, and extend from the base class component harness. And then we want to set the host selector. And we're setting this to be app add comment, which is the same selector as the component. So we need to be able to match that up, right? Or Angular needs to be able to match that up. So this is uh, um, set as the same as the component. And now we can talk about getting those UI elements. We're going to use the base class's locator for method and pass in the selector input, which was what that first element, the first HTML element was. What this does is returns a test element, which was that wrapper around the native API, native HTML API. But we're not returning the test element directly, we're returning a function that returns a test element. And that's so that we have that latest state on this control. And then we'll do the same thing for button. Next, we want to think about the API that we'd want to use for working with the, comp with the uh, commenting component. And for a commenting component, it probably makes sense to get a comment and to set a comment. There's probably more methods that make sense as well, but we will just focus on these two for right now. So to get a comment, we first want to get the HTML element for the input by making that, uh, making that call. And then we, then we can work with the test element API to get the value, uh, to get the property value. Now for set comment, we'll do a little error handling to make sure that the comment that was passed in is valid. Then we'll get that comment input element and then work with the test element API to set that value. And with that, the component test harness guts is completed. Now we want to add that filters, though. So to do so, we'll import that uh, uh, add, comment, add a comment harness filters that we created earlier. And then we'll define a static method with, which is also following the naming conventions that's already available in um, material components, uh, test harnesses. And this returns a harness predicate. Since we have just that one filtering option, we're going to create one harness predicate and with the option comment. And then we'll implement that that uh, uh, the predicate by just doing a string match and making sure that the option that's passed in matches this component. And now with that, your component test harness wrapper is complete and you can start using it. Except for one more thing, you want to test it, which is um, like Inception, I know it's like you're testing your test, but it is really important because you want to treat it like you're publishing an API, which is what it is, right? So to do this, you're going to use this idea of a test host to test this, uh, uh, this test harness. And let's see, I have an example of how that looks like. To create a test host, you will create a, basically like a component, but within the scope of your testing. And then you're gonna bring in the, uh, the original uh, component that we created the test harness for, which is the app add comment. Now this uh, uh, special like stub component within the scope of testing is then what we'll be using within our test. So after we create the, uh, in the test bed setup, notice that we are going to create the component fixture for that test component. And then we're gonna declare both that test component as well as that original add comment component. And then we'll create the uh, harness loader and then this is what we'll be using to write the individual test and then using our test harness that we created to test it. So this is how we'll, we'll test that uh, test harness that we created. A little bit of indirection, but this works. And if you, know, if you uh, notice that, uh, um, that component harness base class that we used, that, component, that base class actually has uh, other locator methods that we can call instead of just that locator for which allows our um, test harness to scale as the complexity of our custom component scales. So other ways that we could get access to the 
those elements on that component in addition to locator four, which will return, uh, which we can pass in a selector and it returns a, uh, um, either that element or it's gonna reject the promise, um, is to also, let's see, we don't have to just limit it to passing in a selector, it's actually what's cool. We can also pass in other test harnesses. So if your component is a composition of multiple other components that each have their own test harnesses, you could search for like a mat input to, uh, harness here as well. Uh, locator for optional is another method we could use. And this, instead of re rejecting the promise, it'll just return null. And this is useful if you have any like conditional elements within your components. And then lastly, you can also call locator for all, which will return all of a particular type. So if you have just a bunch of buttons on your page, you can get all the buttons at once. But remember, just because we have these methods to these locator for methods that can grow and scale as our complexity of our components increases, when writing components, small is winning. Not only is it good design practices to keep your components really small, it'll make it easier for you to write your test harness around it too. So we have some recipes for winning. We could use test harnesses to, you, to keep UI testing cleaner and easier to maintain. You can use test harnesses whenever you're working with angular material components because they're already built in, so you might as well take advantage of it. And you want to write test harnesses for any of your shared components. And don't forget to test your test harness, right? And treat it like an API it is. So now you are such a winner at writing winning tests. You can check out my repo on GitHub. I have this entire project as well as tests with and without harnesses all through in there. And the implementation of that custom uh, component test harness and tests around it. So it's all there. It's also a great starter kit if you want to create your own K-Drama fan site. Um, there's two documentation on um, Angular's, uh, actually it's on material.angular.io that I highly recommend reading if you're interested in this. One is how to write tests using material component test harnesses, and the other one is how to author your own uh, custom test harnesses. That authoring guide also has a, uh, information on how to author your own harness environments if your favorite testing library isn't covered. And feel free to reach out to me at Elisa Duncan if you have any questions, comments, or if you have any suggestions for other K-dramas to watch. I am really interested. <laughs>